transition pictures for the 15th century artist Leonardo da Vinci. He died at the age of 67 in the year 1519 of a stroke after a series of strokes, I think. Uh, one of his hands was severely crippled uh, by that time. Uh, but he was a genius, utter, utter genius. He was an engineer, he was a sculptor, he was an inventor, he was a painter who produced such iconic artworks as the Mona Lisa, which is in the uh, Louvre in Paris, and of course, the Last Supper, which uh, if you've seen it, is pretty stupendous. But he left a ton of work unfinished. He never got around to certain things. And I think as he got older, he was full of regrets about not completing all these different things. He was one of those people who was um, a jack of all trades and a master of all of them. And it became very, very difficult for him to do all the things that were in his head. And he scattered his energies. And uh, I think it preyed on his mind as he got older. But I thought I'd take a look at his pictures and see how he transitioned. Well, when I went into that metaphorical chamber I always see, there was a pole, but he didn't slide down it. I've drawn it as if he slid down it, but that's actually not true. He floated around it gradually, like a leaf tumbling to the ground. Now, normally, I don't notice what people are wearing uh, unless it's relevant to the pictures. And I assume this was relevant because he was wearing a cloak which went down past his knees. I haven't drawn it in all the pictures, but he actually was wearing that throughout. And when he looked out, somewhat perplexed by what had happened to him, he saw that this metaphorical cave that I always see was filled with water. It was like a small lake. It was a kind of wooden pontoon thing there, floating. He climbed on it and began paddling across the lake. And as he went, he leaned over and peered into the water at his reflection. Essentially reflecting on who he was and what he'd done. And what this was, this experience that he was so intrigued by. And he saw his face reflected back up at him from the surface of the water. But even as he was doing that, other faces appeared beneath the surface of the water. Shimmering, moving, shifting. He could hear voices, but they weren't directed at him. They were talking about him. There was mumbling, there was gossip, and he was deeply startled by this. He knew all the people whose faces were in the water. He knew what they were saying about him, even though he couldn't hear their words. These people were unhappy. They were angry at him. They were false friends in some cases. I took a look at his handwriting through his signature, and what's really interesting about it is that he could give you quite a tongue lashing. This guy had just the words to put you down, just the words to fight you off. Probably as a defense mechanism for his sensibilities. Don't forget, he was gay in a time when homosexuality wasn't necessarily embraced. And I think was even charged with sodomy when he was in his 20s. I think that's true. But um, whatever it was, he had to defend himself verbally. And now all these people, maybe people he had attacked at some point or said something rude to, were gossiping about him after he'd gone. And when the pontoon reached the other side where the tunnel is, he just leapt off it and fell backwards. It's like, oh God, what was that? And once he'd taken it in and realized he was not going back there under any circumstances, he turned around and started walking up the tunnel. But the tunnel this time was extraordinary. It had these strange archways every so often that had very, very sharp points on them. Now, all he would have to do is walk at the center of the tunnel and go nowhere near the spikes. 
the sharp points and he would be fine. But he didn't. He used them for support. And as he reached out, the spikes went right through his hands. And increasingly injured, he walked up the tunnel. And I thought, I wonder what he's seeing as he looks out. Can I align with his consciousness like I can with some people and see what he's seeing in this tunnel? And it was the same tunnel, only everything was red. The whole thing, a kind of pinky red colour, not blood red, but pinky red colour. I can't explain that unless it's anger. Unless it's some kind of deep-seated fury about life. Often genius is counterbalanced with near insanity or rages or unpredictable action. Maybe that was it. But he seemed angry and full of negative emotions. He continues going up the tunnel until he gets to the light. And he regards it quizzically, almost like it's somebody else's invention. But there was still this deep sense, for whatever reason, of rage. And bear in mind, he's still wearing that cloak. And as he approached the dome, this metaphorical thing I always see to represent the light, as he approached it, he reached into his cloak and he pulled out a knife, a dagger. And instead of stepping into the light, he hacked at it with the knife and he tore great gashes in it. It's like he was angry at God. He understood that this was the link to the divine and he had a grudge against God. Take that and that and that. That's what I think of you. It's as if the perfection of creation threw his own work into a bad light and made him jealous in some way. And he wanted to destroy it. And he stood almost like panting before the dome, weakened, self-pitying, maybe, out of energy. And it's almost as if unconditional love, grace, recognized how damaged he was and came forward and wrapped loving arms around him as you would a young child who has thrown a tantrum and is all out of energy. Come on, fella. You're tired. Step inside. Let's saw you out. Because he had no fight left in him. And he let Grace pull him into the light. And he was gone. But it just brought to mind things I've said before about investing in the separation of us and God, as if God is a separate thing that can be angry at us or judge us or support us or not. Something quixotic, something that just makes decisions on the spur of the moment and we are just the victims of that. What this felt like was that Leonardo da Vinci had abdicated his power to this mythical idea of a god. That he'd invested in monotheistic dualism to the point where that separation led to despair, fear, and anger because he couldn't see the splinter of the divine that was inside of him. And we do the same thing. Not necessarily with God, but we give our power away all too often. We have fights with people. We resent employers who did us wrong. We get angry at politicians. We feel rage towards people who 
cheat and lie. Whatever it is. But every time we do that, we walk away from wholeness and we give our power away to other forces, outside forces. Wholeness requires us to be centered and in our power. Which means in alignment with our divine self. But wholeness is not perfection. We are not here to be perfect, but to learn and grow in order to overcome our imperfections. A genius he might have been, but he had stepped away from his own divinity and his own wholeness. That simply doesn't work. We are gods. We are divine. Maybe he couldn't understand that. But we can. And we can do better. And that's what I learned from Leonardo da Vinci. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Like, share, subscribe if you want. That'd be great. Follow me on Twitter at Cash Peters. Otherwise, I'll see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.